I want to thank you so much to Sopranos ARB for not only having this interview, but also remaining loyal fans of the show and being able to bring to all of the Arab countries and the Middle East these wonderful interviews with the cast and with everyone that you can interview and bringing this to the world. You're sharing your insights, your thoughtfulness, and your generosity is means a lot to me in my heart. And I'm so grateful for you to connect all of us together throughout the world. So thank you so much to Sopranos ARB for being a wonderful force on the um, in the uh, podcast world. Thank you so much. When I was six years old, I did a lot of theater, uh, started in a lot of theater. My mom was a big actress. She was a star in Broadway, a big actress. And I used to read all of the plays that we had in our house. Um, some of the great playwrights uh, were Ibsen and Chekhov and Eugene O'Neill and Tennessee Williams and Shakespeare. And I would go through all the plays and read all the plays. And my mom uh, was a singer and a dancer. And so some of the first things that I've done uh, were doing musicals. Um, and then I started doing, I, I, <laughs> I sent a picture of myself made up like a clown, not really a clown. I, I was trying to look like a character from Star Trek. <laughs> so it ended up looking like a clown. I was young. And I sent a picture to an agent and I said, I am an actor. It is very important that I meet with you right away. <laughs> and so this agent called my mother or my father answered the phone and said, what did my daughter do? She, she sent you a picture. What did she do? And she said, I would like to meet with her. And she says that she's uh, an actress in the theater. <laughs> so we went to meet with her. And I ended up doing a lot of commercials, a lot of famous commercials. One of my first commercials, um, I starred in with, with other famous actresses in our, in our business. So I, I did everything from McDonald's. Um, I did Kool-Aid, I did Michael Jackson's Pepsi commercial, his famous Pepsi commercial, I starred in that. And it just kept going on from there when I realized I wanted to take the my craft very seriously, I studied a lot. And I studied, I went to acting classes and I ended up going to, uh, USC and I was a cinema major and a drama minor and I was very serious about about my artistic and creative integrity because I knew that actresses in the industry were looked down upon in many ways they are uh, objectified and I wanted to be taken seriously. So I really wanted to know, I wanted to learn everything I could. And I, I kept doing theater as well. And um, Shakespeare was, was one of my, my loves. So I did a lot of Shakespeare in the park. And even when I was doing TV shows, I ended up on, uh, on a lot of big TV shows when I was a, a child. So I was a child star growing up in Los Angeles. And that's how I got my start. And as a matter of fact, uh, Dan Adius, who was the director of The Sopranos, was he was um, 
working on, I don't know if you get it there, um, 90210, Beverly Hills 90210. So I was the star of the two hour pilot of 90210. And Dan Adius, um, he was an ace director. So you have, you have production, different people in production. He was an ace, called an ace director. And he was the ace director of 90210. And he worked with Charles Rosen. And they had 10 episodes written for me. But I had gotten two other movies. So I couldn't do the TV show as a regular character, which I was supposed to be a regular character. And I ended up doing the two movies. And then years later, when The Sopranos came around, Dan was the director on The Sopranos. I heard that they were casting, trying to find this character in New York for The Sopranos. And I didn't have any representation at the time. And I thought, how am I going to audition when I don't have a representation? So I called a friend of mine and I said, I love this casting director very much. Her name is uh, Georgianne Walken. And she worked with another casting director that I loved very much, Sheila Jaffe. And I said, can you, I, I heard that they can't find someone that they're looking for. Can you ask them if I can audition? I was talking about the FBI agent. I wasn't talking about Valentina. I didn't even, think that I would be able to play Valentina because she was a bombshell. And I didn't see myself as a bombshell. And I had already played an FBI agent with um, another character on The Sopranos, um, uh, I don't know, um, he played uh, Artie Bucco, his name is John Venemilia. And we played boyfriend and girlfriend on a show that I did with him called C-16 FBI. And that was with Eric Roberts. This was years, years before. So I was thinking, oh, they're casting the FBI agent. I can play the FBI agent. And I got the word back that, yes, they would like to audition me. But they wanted me to audition for Valentina. And I said, well, I, I, I don't think I can play a bombshell like that. But if you let me audition for the FBI agent, I'll also audition for Valentina and you can take your pick. <laughs> and they said, that's great. But we need your recording by tomorrow in the morning. And this was in 2000. I think. So in 2003, we didn't have the proliferation of technology that we have today. We had video cassettes and little cameras. We, we didn't have, it wasn't very easy to record ourselves. And it was already the end of the day in Los Angeles. So I called my friend who was a casting director and I asked if I can borrow her camera. I put everything on the camera. I read the roles for Valentina. And then I also did the scene for the FBI agent thinking, oh, I'll play the FBI agent. They'll see, they'll see I'm much better for the FBI agent. And it took a while because I had to transfer what was on the camera to a VHS. <laughs> so by the time I did that and went to FedEx, I was the last package for FedEx. And I saw the little package going down the little conveyor belt. And uh, I forgot about it. I just thought, oh, 
uh, I don't know if they'll like it, who knows? And I get a call the next day saying, will you go to New York? And I said, you know, if I go to New York, it's a, it's a, it's a lot to get on a plane, a commercial plane and go to New York. I need to know how serious they are about me because I don't know if I'm going to get on a plane and get there. And, you know, maybe if I set up some other auditions there or if I do maybe Shakespeare in the park there, it, it could work. And they said, no, no, you've got the part. I said, oh, great. I'm going to play the FBI agent. <laughs> and they said, no, you're going to play Valentina. And I, I really didn't think that I could do it. Um, I said, well, I hope you have really good wardrobe and makeup. <laughs> and they said, we have everything. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> so that was my experience with Valentina. And Dan Adius, who was the director, who had been the ace director on 90210, said to Charles Rosen, because they worked on another TV show called Northern Exposure with David Chase. They said that David had a completely different idea and direction for Valentina. And once he saw my tape, he said, that's it. I want her. So I was, uh, I was surprised, but happy. Well, now that I'm playing a bombshell, I had a little bit of confidence. <laughs> and Jamie and I had a lot of scenes together that um, required for us to be very close. And we were going out a lot to, to spend time together, to be very comfortable. We, I, I, I worked with Jimmy before, James, on a movie called Get Shorty. So I already knew James and had worked with him before. But this was a completely different experience now. And we went to dinner. And there was a gentleman who, was, who came up to us. He was a big fan of the show, but I had not, my, my season had not aired yet. We were just starting to film and he was very drunk and he kept swaying back and forth when he was talking to us. And then he points at me and he says, what are you doing with her? You can do much better than her. I've got a girl for you, get rid of her. <laughs> and James said, hey, this is my this is my sister. You don't talk like that about my sister. This is my sister. And he 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 pulled a you know, he, he said it like Tony Soprano, like, don't fuck with my sister. And the guy literally froze. And then he I didn't know what was going to happen. He was swaying back and forth. And I said. Jimmy, I think he's going to fall over or he's going to vomit. I don't know which one, but something is going to happen. <laughs> he just fell over. And the Mater D came and took him by the arms and dragged him away and said, enjoy your dinner. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So we, we had funny stories like that all the time. Another funny story was, you know, usually after we were done filming, we had these crazy nails on our fingertips. You see the long nails that we have in the show? And they're glued on with a lot of nail polish. So all of the women, after we were done for the day filming, we would have these contests. If we can hit each other with our nails, but we would flick them and they would fly off our fingers. <laughs> so we had a uh, nail flicking contests to see if we can hit each other with the nails. So that was another fun thing that we did. Um, you know, we it it was it was such a wonderful family 
we were it was such a wonderful family to work with that we always had funny stories, crazy stories, and uh, we also had a lot of fun. Very, very close and very trusting, and there is a lot of intimacy in terms of um, um, trust. You know, we had great friendships and and like a family. Well, at the time of my career, when when I was a child star growing up, I I was very well known. I was on Oprah Winfrey. I was in all of the magazines, on all of the TV shows. And I was also known as a real estate investor at a very young age because I would take my money and invest it. And everyone knew when I was investing in something. I had the ability when I left my career for a while when I was young um, to be not so known in public. And that was that was nice for me because I had lived my life in public, in the public eye as a, as a young girl. I was always in the public eye and I did not have a lot of privacy. So when I was able to have privacy later on in my life, I appreciated it. When I got The Sopranos, I knew that my career was going to change again that I would be more in the public eye, but I would also be in the public eye in a different way because now I was playing this type of figure that um, we call them racy. They're very racy, you know, the sex, sex symbols and sex figures. And I had never done that in my career. And I knew that that was going to change my career in a lot of ways because I wouldn't maybe get other roles that I wanted that didn't have that type of character. So I immediately got um, another role, reoccurring on another role called uh, CSI. You know the TV show CSI? And I was wearing, you know, gloves, medical gear, medical jacket. So CSI is a very uh, serious program also. Um, and they have medical terminology and it's forensics. And I wanted to be able to be seen if I was going to do this role on The Sopranos, which was edgy and risky. I also wanted to be taken seriously and show flexibility and, and diversity in my work. So I was able to do CSI and able to do Sopranos, but I knew that my life would change in terms of being in the public eye again. So it, it diminished my ability to be incognito at times. Incognito meaning, um, you know, being able to go in, in public and not be, you know, al always signing autographs and saying hello to people. So I knew that my life would change drastically in terms of being on a number one show in the world and then playing the girlfriend of one of the most famous characters in the world. So I, I knew it was going to be, be uh, bring a lot more, bring a big fan base. And, um, but we, we navigated through that, I think very well, especially in New York City. There's a lot of people in the city. Um, I thought, oh, it's gonna be difficult to go on the subway again. But then there were times when I was able to throw on a baseball cap and sweatpants and glasses and it was fine. So sometimes I was able to, to get a good disguise. Oh. 
Well, Jimmy and I had worked together before on a movie called Get Shorty. So we were friends. And we'd ha hang out together. We'd got, we had gone to ball games together. Um, you know, I think like with anyone that you would consider family, when someone dies at a young age, a death of that magnitude, um, it's, it's never easy to understand or accept because not only is it an untimely death and their life is cut short, but it makes you confront mortality in a different way. And I think for me, it made me realize the fragility, how fragile life is. And the friends that I have in my life are so important to me. And losing Jimmy was a, a devastating experience for all of us. And I think he was a generous, a very generous man, a caring, giving individual that would give so much of his time and care into everything that he did. Even on, on Fridays after during filming, he would pay for the best sushi chef in all of New York City to come make sushi for everyone, the cast, the crew, everybody on the set on his own dime because he was just generous that way. And giving that way, he he did a lot of philanthropy. I know that he would he would give to people without them even knowing that they were being given to. So he would he would give to people, send them money, and they wouldn't even know that it was from James Gandolfini. <laughs> so there's there's a type of his part of his character that was just so kind and generous. It was a loss for all of us. And I think a loss for the world because it's very rare to find a human being in the world like that. It's, it's people like that are rare. Usually people are focused on their own needs on what they can obtain themselves. And they very, very rarely think so generously about other people. But James was always thinking about other people because he, he was very grateful and he knew how blessed he was. And he always just wanted to help people. So losing him was, was a devastating, devastating experience for all of us. Well, I think, um, I think my role was as big as it needed to be. I think um, we had so much fun preparing for that role. And I think the, I think the chemistry and the relationship between the two characters was so, um, it, I mean, there, there was a profundity to what, to what their relationship was and who they were as people together. I don't think it needed to be bigger. I think that, he, I think that it was perfect the way it was because you always want to leave people wanting more. You always, want to, you always want to leave people saying, oh gosh, I wish I can see more of that character as opposed to, oh, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's sometimes when when series ends and they end in good timing and it makes you want more. Sometimes it's good to miss people and want want to see more of them and not be able to get that. So I think it was perfect. Well, my character, she was, she loved to have fun. She. 
I love the fact that they had such great chemistry together. You know, she starts off as one character's girlfriend, Ralphie's girlfriend. But when she meets Tony, they have such a connection, such a spark that is undeniable. And I loved that chemistry between them. Well, I thought it was brilliant the way they ended my character because there was a part of my character that was predicated and based on so much superficiality and everything was about looks and superficial monetary money things that were that were um you know <laughs> based on based on everything on the outside and there was something really profound that happened to me after i filmed the last scene of of valentina getting burned and you know her having her having to then um face the last trajectory of you know what's what's going to happen for the rest of her life now that she's not able to rely on her hair her beauty the the things that she was being focusing on the superficiality of things when i got off the plane to los angeles a very very good friend of mine who works for michael jackson worked for Michael Jackson at the time. His name was Miko, and I grew up with Miko and Miko's sister. Miko was with a boy that had gotten burned by his father, who took him to Disneyland, doused him in gasoline, and set him on fire as a young boy. So this boy was burned from head to toe, and down to his knuckles. And Miko was with him in the airport. He had a lock of hair left on his head that he braided with, with rainbow color threads. And I got off the plane after filming this burn scene and being in the hospital and having experienced, um, taking myself through that experience. And then I met this boy. And I thought, this is really interesting timing. Um, and I started to work with burn victims from that experience of meeting this boy who had the most beautiful personality. His outlook on life was incredible. And just the fact that he was there, I felt like it was God saying to me, you know, do something, do something that you can do for, for people. And I personally always wanted to do something of profound significance in this world before I leave. And so I started working with the Make-A-Wish Foundation, with burn victims and children. So it playing that role affected me in a lot of ways. And I think that it, taught people i think the the through the writing and through the storytelling it taught people a lot about about their focus in life and um and i know it it touched me very deeply and i felt honored to play something uh, that had such a significant storyline Well, when I first read it and saw it, I thought the music that David Chase chose was Don't Stop Believing. And that was a sign that, oh, don't stop believing in your dreams and don't stop believing what you want to believe in. So it was telling the fans, well, don't stop believing that he's with us, that he's still going to be around. And then 
I heard some interviews with David Chase, which made me think, okay, they just didn't want to show the scene because it would just tear people apart. Here, here's the most amazing thing about James Gandolfini is that he can play a gangster and play someone who murders people and yet you love him. He touches your heart somehow, some way, he finds the humanity in a character like that. And so maybe David didn't want the fans to see a massacre because Meadow's still trying to park her car. She can't park her car, so she's not in there. But the person that walked in, he's just sitting there with Carmel and his son. And I thought, oh, I don't know. I think that they do. I think that they die. I think that they get killed. And then I thought, and then I heard another interview with David saying, oh, that was a death scene. <laughs> so I said, oh, David gave it away. And then, you, you know, years later, I thought, I think David left that scene to be up to whatever you want to believe. And that was what Don't Stop Believing the music was about. That he left it open for you to make up your own mind and decide what you want to decide. Do you want him to live or do you want him to die? That's up to you. Well, I think we all did. I think we all made each other laugh all the time. Uh, Jimmy was definitely a funny guy. Michael Imperioli, he's brilliant. And he's also a brilliant writer. I don't know if a lot of people know that, but he's an amazing writer. Um, Uncle Junior made me laugh. I think the writers were so brilliant with some of the writing for, for Uncle Junior. The things that would come out of his mouth that were so random, you had to just, I mean, it just made you just giggle because you could be in the middle of an intense scene and he'll ask for red peppers out of nowhere. And you just think, where did that line come from? So that's the writers being funny. Um, and I think I really loved, um, oh, what's her name? Um, uh, the, the girlfriend with one leg, uh, Irina, is that her? Irina, can't remember. Um, it's been so many years now. Irina, yeah? I mean, to, to have a girlfriend that has one leg. I mean, the, the writing really was brilliant. And I, so I think the funniest people were the writers. But if you're, if you're saying like who would, who would tell jokes and make people laugh, it was definitely Jimmy. For me, it was Jimmy. Steve Van Zandt, hilarious. And he's also an icon in many ways, having been a musician with, um, Bruce Springsteen's band and, you know, he was a musical icon. He was brilliant. So, so many different people in so many different ways, you know, Abdul, they, they just touched me in so many different ways. Even uh, Edie Falco, she's just a brilliant actor. She's so good. There's, there's scenes between Edie's character, uh, Carmela, and Tony Soprano, and Jimmy's character, Tony. And it's some of the best acting that I've ever seen in my life. And then they can go, they can leave the scene after an intense scene, and then just crack each other up and make each other laugh. Like in, in two seconds after, you know, crying their eyes out in a scene and throwing things at each other and screaming and yelling and then just make each other laugh off the set. Thank you so much to all of the fans, the Sopranos ARB and all of the fans in the Middle East and all of the Arab countries and Arab regions. Thank you so much for being loyal fans, for appreciating our work 
for loving the stories that we tell and appreciating our art and sharing that with us. And we share that with you and we're connected with you in so many ways. We appreciate you and love you. And thank you for watching and thank you for tuning in and thank you for, um, for showing your appreciation and tuning into these podcasts that we do and following us. And, uh, and I would love for you to follow uh, me on Instagram. I'm Leslie Ray Bega. So it's L-E-S-L-I-E-R-A-E. B-E-G-A. I just signed up recently on Instagram and I'd love to see you and communicate with you. And I look forward to seeing you, more of you guys soon. Thank you so much.